answer your tennis questions. I'm sure they'll be pouring in as we go along here. Let me start out with three of my favorite single strategies that are going to help you to win more matches. Number one is try to be the player. It's a little you know, against the grain, but try to be the player who hits higher over the net rather than lower over the net. So the reason for this is the net is the number one mistake that occurs when people play a match. The net is the number one mistake. So you got to avoid the number one mistake and you do that by hitting the ball higher. You also will then hit the ball deeper. Yes, I'm live. Thank you for the like. Thank you so much. So go ahead and throw in your questions and I'm going to answer them. I'll be on here probably for about an hour. Uh, we're going to go through uh, some strategies, some footwork, some technique, I'm sure, with all of your questions. So three of my favorite singles tips. Be the player first. Be the player who averages higher over the net. So the net is the most common mistake. So by aiming higher, you instantly hit the net less, which means you're more consistent. But then you also hit the ball deeper. And the number one way to force an error from your opponent is depth. Depth is the most valuable thing. It's better than spin. It's better than speed. It's better than location and hitting the ball, like getting your opponent to run left and right taking time away from your opponent, whatever it is. Depth is the number one way to force an error. And the easiest way to hit deeper is just to hit higher because then the ball just keeps carrying and it will land deeper. So tip number one to win more singles matches is simply be the player on average who hits the ball higher over the net. Number two, get to the net. Now, an easy way to get your opponent to hit short is to hit deep. By the way, we got 26 people in here and only three likes. Oh, let's try to get the likes up closer, please. Thank you so much. Just brings more people in. Thank you, thank you. So when you hit the ball deeper, that often pushes your opponent back. They will not subsequently, and I see a question there, I'll be there in just a second. They will not most likely hit the ball higher. They'll probably hit the ball harder, which means they'll hit the net a lot, but they'll also hit the ball short. You have got to get to the net if you want to raise your level of play. I got a question for all of you. Give me a percentage. Give me a percentage. What percentage of the points when Federer stayed behind the baseline? What percentage of the points? Uh, hi, Jacinta. Hey, how are you? I'm so excited. Thank you for being here. What percentage of the points did Federer win? And we'll get to doubles. We'll get to doubles, Francis. What percentage of the points did Federer win when he stayed behind the baseline during the point in his career? Do you know what percentage of the points? Thank you. We got up to 11 likes now. Thank you so much. We got 35 people here and 12 likes. Let's try to get that up, right? What percentage? Can somebody tell me what percentage you think Federer won his entire 20 plus year career? What percentage of the points did Federer win when he stayed behind the baseline? He stayed behind the baseline. We got 40. We got Rhonda at 55. Brett at 40. DF at 55. KM at 90. What percentage? Understanding this 15, Fradio, uh, Fradio Reek, <laughs> Radio Freak, a little dyslexic. Uh, we got 50. We got 45. We got 30. We got 75. We got 60. Um, so the answer is 47. So Federer won 47% of the points when he stayed behind the baseline. That means if Federer never went to the net, he would have won zero Grand Slams. You cannot win Grand Slams only winning 47% of the points. Because that means your opponent's winning 53%, and that does not equal winning. So what is it that allowed 32? I like how specific that is. It's 47. What allowed Federer to win all those Grand Slams? And it was going to the net. Staying behind the baseline is a losing proposition. Did he have his birthday hat on? He might have. He definitely does when he hits a serve. Staying behind the baseline is not in your best interest. If you're the type of person who says, I'm more comfortable staying behind the baseline, what you're saying is, I have to be mentally tough because I'm going to lose a lot of matches. 
It means that the points are really long. You're probably in really good shape because, you know, the match is going to last five hours. Um, and it's not easy for you to win easy points. When you go to the net, you're going to win easy points. Now, here's the reason. Do you know the reason why players don't, don't want to go to the net? And it's not because they don't win. The reason they don't want to go to the net is because when you lose a point at the net in singles, it's embarrassing. Because think about the only ways you lose the point when you go to the net in singles. Passing shot, a lob, they hit it right at you, like at your feet or at your body. You miss an easy volley or an easy overhead. You know, what's interesting is when people go to the net and they win, I'm sorry, when they go to the net and they lose the point, they always say, I knew I should have stayed behind the baseline. I knew it. I knew I should have stayed back. But you know what's funny is when people stay back and they lose the point, they never say, I knew I should have gone to the net. <laughs> Ball right to the face today. That would hurt. So when you're at the net, you're going to win about 60, like 55 to 65% of the points, we'll say. 55 to 65% of the points. That's a lot better than 47. So you have to get to the net in order to raise your level of play and to start beating people you've never beaten before. Number three, and this has to do with the net, right? Number one was hit higher over the net than your opponent on average. I'm not saying moon ball. I'm just saying hit a little higher over the net on average than your opponent. You'll hit the net less and you'll hit deeper, forcing errors. Number two is get to the net more often. The three times to go to the net, serve and volley when your opponent's in trouble and when you get a short ball. Here's number three. And if you're liking this uh, free live, make sure you hit the like button, right? We got 17 likes and 37 people here. And the number three is when your opponent comes to the net, do not avoid your opponent. Do not avoid your opponent. When your opponent comes to the net, involve them in the point. You're not playing Pete Sampras. That's not, Martina Navratilova is not approaching the net. If you're playing Martina Navratilova, do not involve her in the point. Like, avoid her at all costs. You're playing one of the greatest players of all time. But you're not. You're playing George and Bob and Sue and Carol. So when your opponent comes to the net, just make them volley. When your opponent comes to the net, make them volley. One of two things are going to happen. First, they're not just going to come in and pound a winner especially off an approach shot, because on an approach shot, they're gonna be around the service line. So you have a lot of room to just hit it right at them and let gravity and topspin bring the ball down and get them to volley below net level. They'll miss half of those. The other half, they're gonna either hit some screaming winner to the corner, but you don't have to worry about that because you don't have to win every point. A lot of times though, they'll hit short and then you step inside the court and then you go for the pass. And by the way, you wanna hit that ball down the line. Cross court will either go right to them or you'll hit it long. Yes, not wide. I said long for a reason. If you hit cross court and the ball lands in the doubles alley, you missed long because if it had landed shorter, it would have been in. So it's hard to hit cross court with a lot of spin and dip that ball. It's fun to do and it feels great when we do it. But on a percentage basis, like you can't just keep trying it and trying it and saying, oh, I make, I make one out of four, but it's really fun to make that one. Well, then you're going to lose too many. So my three tips for you in singles... And then I'm going to look through the questions. Three tips for you real quick are hit higher over the net than you normally do. That way you avoid the net and hit deeper. Go to the net more often. And that way you're able to force your opponent into errors because they're not going to involve you unless they're a member of twominutetennis.net or they're watching uh, Two Minute Tennis videos. They're not going to involve you in the point. They're going to do everything to avoid you because that's the, um, the common thinking that occurs. Uh, so you just going to the net, they'll do everything to avoid you. And you, half the time, you don't even have to volley. But I don't want you to do that when your opponent comes to the net. When your opponent comes to the net off an approach and you're running over here, just hit it right to them because they'll be around the service line for their first volley because they don't get to the net for their first volley. The, the second volley is hit closer to the net. So the first volley needs to be low. That way it pops up. That way you can come in and then go for the passing shot. All right. 
we got a lot more likes here, which is great. Let's see what we got here. My server's all, all over the place uh, in the net, way out sometimes. It goes in five straight, then I keep missing. I'm pretty good at hitting, but tons of power, but I have no control. I'm feeling it's my toss. All right, 16G. Let me explain what it is. And it is, sorry, I forgot. I plugged my phone in because I was low on power. Um, I'm the guy who goes live on YouTube with a phone that's low on power. Here's the reason why your serve is inconsistent and it has nothing to do with your toss. I mean, it could, but chances are it's not. Because what you are talking about is an issue with the grip. Serves that have a ton of power and very little control, you have a forehand grip. That's the issue. The issue is you are not hitting spin. So let me ask uh, how to beat a moon baller. Yeah, move inside the baseline, take that ball out of the air, hit short. Uh, 16G, let me ask you something. Can you quickly just respond to this? When you serve, do you try to hit flat serves or do you try to hit spin serves? Do you try to hit flat serves or do you try to hit spin? Uh, let's see, Professor Booty, can you cover underarm <laughs> serve stats? Uh, I, I have no idea what those stats are, so I, I cannot. <laughs> I apologize. Um, which kind of serve do you suggest learn first? Radio Freak, this is exactly the question that I'm posing to 16G right now. That is the exact thing. And the question is, uh, or the answer to that is a slice serve. The first serve everybody should be learning is a slice serve. And the reason is because the slice serve is the serve that naturally occurs when you first put a student in a continental grip. The reason players hate the continental grip at first is because they're trying to hit flat. And that's because when they hit a forehand grip serve, it was always flat. So in their mind, they're used to flat, 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 flat. So then you put a slice serve or continental grip in their hand and then their brain's thinking, ah, I want to hit flat. So then they lay their wrist back and they do this and they go palm up and, they, and or they'll just change their grip. You got a broken string on that racket boss. Yeah, I'm well aware of that. <laughs> you didn't think I knew that? Um, so, so when I'm sure all of us have had broken strings on our rackets, right? So when you have your continental grip, the beauty is it's got a slice component to it. Now, here's the issue. Here's the issue. I love when people tell me things like, like I didn't know. It's just, I find it funny. So um, when you put spin on a serve, you have to aim to the right if you're right-handed, left if you're left-handed. The ball doesn't go where your strings point. I'm sorry, <laughs> check that, reverse it. The, the ball doesn't go the direction you swing. It goes where your strings point. So what happens is players who hit very flat serves are used to swinging the direction their ball goes. So they think, oh, the ball goes where I swing. It doesn't. The ball doesn't go where you swing. The ball goes where your strings point. For instance, look at this. Look at me do this. Where's the ball going? The ball's going up. But where's my racket going? My racket's going over there. When a ball is coming into you, it hits a surface and goes back out. So if you swing down, the ball goes forward with backspin. If you go up, the ball goes forward with topspin. The ball goes where your strings point, but not where your racket uh, travels. So if, as a righty with a continental grip, swing to the right. The reason the ball goes so fast is because you're hitting so flat. So use your continental grip, swing to the right, and put a lot of spin on the ball. When training with my coach, I can hit the two-handed backhand, but during the match, I can only hit slice. What do you think is wrong? Um, Tom, we used to do that with the junior program. So what I would do um, is you have to create a punishment. So at the club where I used to coach before I went fully online is uh, as a coach, is we would create stipulations in the junior program that they had to do something or they would lose the point automatically. So the basic three rules of losing a point, double bounce, hitting the net or hitting out were involved. But then we would add a fourth one and we would say, all right, everyone must serve in volley for the next five minutes or you'll lose the point automatically. 
or everyone must hit a top spin backhand or you lose the point automatically. Everyone must for the next five minutes. All right, for the next five minutes, everyone must hit a slice backhand or you lose the point automatically. Um, when your opponent comes to the net, you have to lob as high as you can or you lose the point automatically. By doing that, you force the result to happen. So what you might want to do um, is make it laps that you have to run, give yourself some punishment, record your match, and if you hit a slice, you have to do, you have to run a lap after the match. Whatever it is, you have to create a stipulation where you're forced to do it. Because I know for a fact, who asked that question? Tom Devin, uh, Devin, Tom. I know for a fact that if I offered you $1 million to go out in cash, you don't have to pay any taxes, a million dollars cash that wait, uh, during the point you must hit topspin, you would not hit one slice. You'd be like, this is amazing. I'm going to hit slice every time. Why? Because you're going to get rewarded. Well, here, uh, I don't have my checkbook with me, so I can't give you a million dollars. Yeah, that's why. Um, and so you got to create a situation. Uh, younger, don't you mean young? You ain't young anymore. Uh, let's see here. I would do it for a dollar. That's really funny. Underarm serves go in 83% of the time on first serves and are winners compared to 71 of, of overhead serves. Yeah, I, I don't know the, uh, the stats on that. When I was younger, I had a great serve. Uh, people used to compliment me all the time. Now I still hit it hard, but it's like I miss more than I make even when I try to slice it. Uh, 16G, it might be that we need to do a Zoom private lesson. Go to twominutetennis.net and sign up for a Zoom lesson. Jacinta will tell you all about it. Um, I do not know what the MTMCA method is. I don't, but I'd be interested to hear it. I'm not confident with my tops and backhand during the match. That's why I avoid hitting it. No, I understand, but you're only, you're only, you're not going to become confident by not doing it. You're confident doing it. Hey, thanks so much. <laughs> Dookie fart. Thanks so much. Great name. Uh, so that's the, uh, that's the thing. Like, I know you're confident in practice. You're just not confident in a match. If I were to offer you a million dollars, you wouldn't care about confidence. It's not about confidence, it's about courage. Confidence comes from practice. You have to have the courage to do it initially. Confidence is super overrated. You just have to have the courage to try it. You're the PR, you are. Do you have any tips, Rhonda, for developing a more consistent toss? Oh man, absolutely. Let's talk about it. So the first thing you wanna do when it comes to improving the toss consistency is, and I'm gonna give you maybe like five ideas or so, four ideas, um, but uh, the couple ideas here are uh, not in like any particular order. First though, I will say, try tossing slower. So one issue with tosses, Rhonda, is that players toss way too fast and the ball goes way up in the air. Higher tosses are not better tosses. That the higher you toss, you just have more time to screw up your swing. Uh, so, and, and higher tosses give you less time to hit the ball. So when you toss super high, bad stuff happens. Another thing that you can try is your, instead of having your palm up, have your palm to the side. So it's like I'm holding this water bottle, right? So my palm is to the side. So have your palm to the side. The reason is, one of the reasons that players toss too high or too fast or erratically is that they either bend their elbow or flick the wrist, roll the ball off the fingertips, and the ball can go all over the place. The goal is to only move the shoulder. And one of the easiest things to um, make sure that you only use the shoulder is to simply turn your hand 90 degrees. So hold the ball like it's a glass of water. Because with your arm in this position, you can't bend the elbow. Because notice my elbow position is different. When I turn my hand to the side, now my elbow points to the side. So I'm, now I'm not going to bend my elbow. I'm only going to move my shoulder. Now my wrist position, because when my elbow, when my palm is up, I can move my wrist like this. When the palm's to the side, it doesn't move as much. And you're not going to flick like this. The shoulder is going to dominate. And then, of course, you can't roll the ball off your fingertips. Um, so I would work on having the... Uh, um, have, having your, your palm to the side. And then the last thing would be, you can create like a little target. Like, and, and you gotta do this. Like it's one thing to just hear it, right? But you gotta, 
actually go out and do this. But let me make sure you can see this. Oh yeah, you can see it. Is to just have like a cone or a bucket in front of you and so toss slowly, toss with your palm to the side and just try to hit the target. So those three should be good. Let's see, we got, oh man, we're only at 26 likes with 42 people in here. Oh. Uh, hey Ryan, my dad is a four or five player and I'm a good junior. Our coach is against using different grips on volleys. Do you think it's still viable to use different grips at that level? Yes. Anybody who tells you that you don't have enough time to change your grips has never tried it. Guaranteed. You have plenty of, time is not the issue when it comes to changing grips. That is not the issue. There's plenty of time to change grips. And I always know when someone has never tried it. And it's when they tell me there's not enough time. Because they're just regurgitating what they heard somebody else say. Like, this person heard this person say it. And the reason this person said it is because they heard this person say it. And it just whispers down the lane. I've never had once somebody come to me on Con content or whatever and, and email or in person and say, hey, Ryan, I tried changing grips and there wasn't enough time. Yeah, you got it, Rhonda. Happy to help. Nobody ever says it. It's just the reason they say it is there's not enough time, but they're only saying it because they heard somebody else say it. What do you think takes more time? What takes more time? Changing the grip or the split step, the turn, the hit and the step. What do you think takes more time? <laughs> you can, everyone's an expert. Yeah, just hit that. Like, I, and I don't care if somebody has an opinion that's different, different than mine, but enough time to change grips. There is plenty of time to change the grip 95% of the time. And as a four or five, you're really good at changing grips. Uh, you're absolutely right. I changed my uh, grip style in a game in my 50s. It works. Yeah. There's plenty of time to change your grip. So don't let somebody tell you that there's not enough time to change your grip. That's not a reason to not change grips. You could say, hey, I just volley better with my one handed, my one grip system. But the reason the one grip system isn't great is no different than trying to hit forehands and backhands with the same grip. Try hitting forehands and backhands with the exact same grip and you're not allowed to change your grip. You'd be like, oh, that'd be awful. Well, that's what happens with the grip system. The fact that the USTA, and I hope they're listening, the USTA, the USPTA, the LTA, Australia, whatever, PTR, it's such baloney. And, and if you're listening to me, stop it. Stop what you're doing. Stop forcing these coaches to have to teach their students and force their students into a one grip system when all it does is it makes people not have confidence at the net. Now I'm starting to get, now I'm starting to get upset because they're messing with like real tennis players who just want to improve. And all they're doing is saying, no, it's gotta be a one grip. Imagine if you took a tennis lesson. Do you know that a hundred years ago, they didn't change grips on, like on the ground strokes? It was continental for everything. Everything was a continental, continental forehand, Continental backhand. And a hundred years ago, if you told someone, hey, you know what? If you turn the grip a little bit to a semi-Western, you can really spin the ball. And then get over on an Eastern backhand, you can really spin the ball. You'd be kicked out of the certifications. Bill Tilden from a hundred years ago is, would be like, are you kidding me? Changing the grips? There's not enough grip. Uh, there's not enough time to change your grip. So I don't teach a continental grip on either the forehand or the back. I don't use a continental grip on any forehand or backhand. Um, and I'm not a pro tennis player. I'm a 5-0 tennis player. But my uh, grip system for the volleys is, here, let me, I had somebody suggest, it is malpractice. It is malpractice. Because Jacinta, when people, I teach Jacinta um, Zoom lessons, so that's why, uh, I keep talking to her all the time. Um, um, I had somebody suggest that I get uh, <laughs> tattoos here, so I don't have to keep writing it. Um, but the grip system that I use is my knuckle on three for the volley and my heel pad on two and a half. And then on the one on the backhand volley, I'm on one and a half. 
on the corner. So that's the grip. And I have, if you don't have time to change your grip, then you're playing doubles and a ball is getting crushed at your face. Like, is that why we're not teaching the, the two grip system? So if somebody has a one grip system and they love their volleys, I never change it. But if they don't like their volleys, I immediately change the grip. Somebody's asking about double strategy, which actually happens to be my favorite topic to teach. Double strategy is so easy to learn and your opponents will not, in my experience, be moving in the correct spots. So let's, let's go over this. Let's talk about the number one, the number one double strategy of them all. And it is hit the ball to the opponent who is standing where you're standing. That's it. Hit the ball to the opponent who is standing where you're standing. There's a big fundamental difference between single strategy and double strategy. Because in singles, there are two people, but in doubles, they've doubled the number of people to four, but they have not doubled the size of the court. And because of that difference, singles is a game of keep the ball away from your opponent, sort of. You can think of it that way, right? Doubles is not a game of keep away. It's a game of hit the ball to the correct opponent. Hit to someone, but hit to the right someone. So it's really simple. If you want to be right 90% of the time, and we'll talk about the 10% exceptions, but exceptions only prove that a rule is true. Baseliners should hit to baseliners. So if you're in the back, hit every ball 100% of the time, and you'll be right 90% of the time. Hit every ball to the baseliner. And this baseliner should hit the ball to this baseliner. And when you're at the net, the same thing is true. Net players should aim for net players. Baseliners hit to baseliners. Net players aim for net players. Here's why. Baseliners in doubles are trying to prolong the point. Did you know that on the pro tour, when you end the point with your shot, you hit the ball and no one else hits it. The point is over. When you end the point as a baseliner, as a pro, you only win 25% of, of those points. You lose 75. This is why it's so tempting to go for that down the line shot because it feels so good when you do it. Why? Because you miss it more than you make it. And I know your brother's cousin's veterinarian's mailman it, it never misses that, but that's not the case. The, case, the, the, the pros, if anybody's gonna be able to do it, it's the pros, right? When you are in the back and your shot ends the point, you win 25% of the time. That's, those are really bad odds. But when you're at the net and you win the point, uh, sorry, you end the point, you win 65% of the time. And you do that by hitting it to the person closer to you and either hitting it right by them or through their legs or maybe you flub it off their racket. The number one double strategy mistake happens all the time and it is horrible for your winning percentage is at the net with any ball that is above net level, whether it's a head level volley, a high volley or an overhead and we hit it to the baseliner. Imagine you're playing dodgeball. Remember as a kid, you play dodgeball, right? Gym class in school, you got the ball and you're looking for someone to throw the ball toward. Who would you pick to throw toward? Would you pick the kid on the other team farthest from you who has the most amount of time to react to your, to your throw? Or would you look for someone close to you because they have less time to react to your shot? It's no different. When you're at the net, aim for this person's shoes. Now, the question then is always, well, Ryan, why don't we just hit through the middle? Because when you hit to the middle, the baseliner goes and gets it. Because when the baseliner sees you with the ball, they immediately start running to the middle. So you should just aim for this side of the court. Aim for the side of the court that is um, occupied by the person closer to you. So number one double strategy you must understand is when you're hitting the ball, you have somewhere to hit it. And it is to a person. And you either hit it to the person, if you're in the back, you hit it to the other baseliner. You hit the ball to the opponent who is standing where you're standing, baseliner to baseliner. And when you're at the net, you do the same thing. You aim to them and you hit it hard. Like I tell my students, when you're this player and your partner is serving and you're the server's partner, 
you should be looking at that person's shoes before the point even starts. And the ball is hit anywhere near you and you've already pre-planned what you're gonna do and you hit it hard to their feet. Of course you don't win every point. You don't have to win every point to win a Grand Slam. All right, let's see what we got here. Uh, what do you say to the doubles opponent that complains that you are trying to hit them? I'm not trying to hit them. <laughs> and I'm not trying to hit them. It's not your job to keep them safe. I'm not saying you're hitting 100 mile an hour balls. That You don't hit a 100 mile an hour ball at their face. You just hit an easy, good stick volley right at their feet. Like, I mean, if they have a problem with you aiming for their feet, then they need to stop playing tennis. Like that, like that's tennis. You aim for their feet. Yes, Kirk, feet. Um, let's see, raise your hand and apologize. Yes, of course. Uh, you, uh, I hit my backhand and uh, 16G. Do you have a one-handed backhand or a two-handed backhand? You should be changing your grip. Uh, what are the most common causes of tuna back grip? My lefty student often hits with the frame and I can't de detect the problem. Michael, the biggest issue for hitting the frame, is it the bottom frame, Michael? Uh, the biggest issue is the right hand under the grip too much. And Michael, I, um, I do this all the time, just so you know. I do Zoom lessons with coaches and students. Uh, yes, the bottom frame. That's why I asked. Yep. So it's, it's going to be the bottom frame. It's going to be your, their right hand is too far underneath when a, uh, or their top hand is too much. What, were they ever a one hander? Were they ever a one handed backhand? The reason I'm asking is because players who are one hander will turn farther with their grip. So there's a really good chance that their top hand or their bottom hand, I'm sorry, their bottom hand or their top hand, or even both, the grip is too far. Um, no, only two-hander. Okay, thanks. Thanks for the quick responses. I appreciate that. So there's a chance that they're hitting like this because their top, their their um, top hand. I'm sorry, their bottom hand. I keep saying top hand because I'm a I'm a righty, so I keep thinking my left hand is my top hand. But I'm, I'm I have to act like a lefty right now. So the bottom hand, the left hand for a lefty, is probably too far, and the right hand is too far. But if you wanted me to do a live Zoom lesson with you and the student, and you know if they're a junior with their parents, I do that all the time. And if I can be very honest with you, a lot of coaches feel like it would make them look bad. No, the, the students will trust you more because they know they are, you are doing everything you can to help them. So I help uh, coaches in California with their students live, in Ohio, in South Africa, they get live on Zoom with me and their student and the parent, if it's a child, if it's a minor, and you know, the three or four of us are looking at the stroke together. Um, think about it. It's something that is extremely popular and it's, you're just getting a second opinion. That's all it is. And if the student improves, you look good, not me. You look good. Check their grips. Chances are their grip. How much is a Zoom lesson? A Zoom lesson is $130 for the hour, or um, which then I do side-by-side -side comparisons of the pros. And instead of this, where I'm just talking to my screen, like I see myself, I don't see anybody. Like it's live on Zoom. I share my screen. I talk to you. People demonstrate. Super interactive. If the grip is right, uh, then what? Uh, I, there's a chance that it's not um, uh, for that to happen. So it might also be that they are not um, rotating their hips at the right time to get the racket to drop. So let me explain. So when you look at Djokovic, when Djokovic hits a two-handed backhand, he makes this move and the racket drops low enough because if you're hitting the bottom frame, that means the racket's too high. So I'll give you two more reasons that it might be that, but check the grips, check the grips. Uh, when players drop the racket in the back and they do not rotate as the racket's dropping, what happens is the racket stays behind the hand. This is what should happen. The racket should drop on a two-handed backhand below the hands, but you don't do this on purpose. The reason this happens, you watch Djokovic, he has like a little bounce to his backhand and the, the racket almost goes like this and then to the side. That happens as a result of the body rotating while the racket's dropping. The weight of the racket's trying to go down as your hands pull forward because the body rotates and it ends up breaking the wrist. And so you make this move. So it might be that they are 
dropping, and I'll do it lefty because your student's lefty, they might be dropping the racket down and waiting till it gets to the very bottom to initiate body rotation. If that's the case, the racket doesn't drop below enough and they might actually catch the bottom edge. So they have to make sure, you have to make sure that when they turn and the racket's up and it should be up, as it's falling, they are rotating. Now I can't do it lefty, but I could do it righty. And they make, th and they make this move. One last thing that might be occurring is they might be using very quick elbow bend, almost like they're doing bicep curls. So you'll see this with students, they'll bend the elbows very early when they hit the ball. And what does that do? It pulls the racket up and they end up hitting the bottom frame. So what you might ask them to do after you check the grip, after you make sure that their body is rotating as the racket's falling, that they don't wait for the racket to get all the way down and then begin rotating, is ask them to extend out after they're done hitting. A lot of times players bend the elbow too early, bend the elbows. What you don't wanna do is bend the elbows to lift the racket. You wanna lift the racket with your shoulders. I'll use my daughter's racket so I don't hit the ceiling here. You wanna swing up through the ball like this, then bend the elbows. When you watch Djokovic hit a backhand, he lifts from the shoulders and then he bends the elbows. He lifts from the shoulders, then bends the elbows. Where most recreational players, they bend the elbows to hit the ball, where he extends up. So one thing you might have them do is don't even go over the shoulder. Just have them hit a backhand and extend and just finish where if they drop their racket, their racket would drop in front of them, not behind them. Uh, so check their grip because if the grip is too far, they're gonna hit the bottom edge over and over again. Um, it, the racket face is too closed. The contact point is too far out in front. And if they do any combination of those, then it gets really bad. So, but again, we could always do a Zoom lesson together. If you're a premium member of my website, uh, it cuts the price in half. Uh, so the Zoom lesson, instead of 130, goes down to 65. Hope that helps. I uh, love your channel. I hope I'm not too late. You're not, Silver. You're not. I am live. It's funny though, too, because I post these lives and then like three days from now, people are gonna be answering the questions that I'm asking, thinking that I'm live, and I always feel bad. I'm like, oh, I'm not live. That was three days ago. Yeah, yeah, when he moon balls, come to the net and cut it off. Um, so Tom, one thing you can do against moon ballers is stand inside, well, there are two things you can do. You can stand inside the baseline, or you can just hit short on purpose. So if you're playing, let's say it's singles, and you're playing a moon baller, all right? This is you, and you have someone who's just pushing and just moon balling. Moon ballers will not hit moon balls from up here. So moon ballers are usually not people who, oh my gosh, we're almost equal with our likes. If you're watching this and you haven't hit the like button, come on now, I'm on here spitting out uh, just gold for you guys to improve your tennis. Uh, so I always like it when the likes are greater than the number of people here. So. If you, let's say you're gonna, you're gonna return serve. If you're playing a moon baller and you get a weak second serve, come in and then just drop it short. Not to hit a winner, like don't think it has to be perfect. Uh, Nadal is a moon baller, no. Nadal is not a moon baller, <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I'm talking like slow, soft like balls that go up in the air. Hey, we beat the number of people here with the number of likes, good, thank you. And that forces them to come up and then they're a fish out of water. They're going to hate Here's that. Here's what I found. Oops. My watch is talking to me. I'm sure you've all do that. Can you do a video on a simple serve just to get the ball in? Nothing fancy or powerful, just something consistent. My serve is so weak uh, that the opponent crushes it back. Huh. Well, a simple serve, it sounds like you have a simple serve that is, that is getting crushed back. Uh, the cuck. So I, I, I would tell you that we need to do a Zoom private lesson on your serve. And I need to like look at your serve and give you actual uh, uh, information that's pertaining to you, not just some video that doesn't pertain to you, that I hope does. Um, go to twominutetennis.net and get a Zoom private lesson with me. And like you send me videos of your serve, we meet live on Zoom and for an hour I put you side by side with Kyrgios and Federer and Djokovic and um, Nadal, because Nadal's serve is underrated technically, uh, JJ Wolf, uh, and I'll give you a whole game plan on how to improve your serve.
Let's go. Don Budge has videos of using Eastern backhands in the 30s. Sure. Absolutely. I'm sure he was called a heretic. Uh, one hand backhand, I noticed when I tighten my uh, racket handle, it's better. It means the opposite of the forehand, relax. Um, yeah. Um, I mean, that, to me, I'm not telling people to use their wrist um, <laughs> how to beat Carlos Alcaraz. Uh, you ain't doing it. He, he, like, what did he just do to, to Shapo today, right? Um, yeah, it's, he, it's too physically powerful. Like, you can't beat that player. He's, he's so powerful. He is so strong. He, his racket speed and his power and the heaviness of his ball is insane. Uh, how to put power on weak balls. When I try to do that, the ball goes out. Yeah, Pedro, super, super common problem. One of the things is uh, players actually do overhit. And so when, yeah, ask Sinner, that's right. Um, but player, when we get into this situation, we think, okay, the ball's really weak, so I'm gonna take the biggest crack at it possible. Um, one thing you'll wanna do is turn higher than you normally do, because players tend to turn the same height if it's a higher ball, and then they have to swing up into it. So I would tell you, if you are gonna contact the ball around head level or shoulder level, and you're inside the court, it's a higher, slower, weaker ball, turn much higher than you normally do. That way, when you drop for racket speed, you're still up with the ball and you can go more straight into it rather than turning where you normally do and getting too far below the ball and trying to spin it. Um, and then if you're trying to hit it hard, you're not gonna put spin on it, so then you end up hitting it with an open racket face and the ball goes out. Um, and another thing you can do, this seems a little uh, old fashioned, but with the high turn, you can try to catch the racket out in front. Um, and by doing that, it actually helps flatten out the shot. That will help. How do I get my weight moving forward on my serve? It seems like I fall sideways. Yeah, Kirk, if you're gonna fall sideways, you're most likely, if you're right-handed, you're moving left. And that's because your toss is too much above your head. So the ball's like mistletoe. So it's all in your toss. So you will lean, like your foot kicks the opposite direction you are leaning. So if I'm serving against that wall, if I toss left, my right foot kicks to the right. Um, and, then, and then people fall off to the left. So you've got to toss purposely forward and to the right if you're right-handed. Um, what I tell people is the ball is not an elevator, so it shouldn't go up and down an elevator shaft. You have to toss forward into the court. Uh, the pros should change grips on volleys? No. I mean, if they want to improve, if they're, if they're not happy with their grip changes. Um, yeah, you got it, Pedro. No. Uh, yeah, that's what you look like. It's because the toss is, look, we, if you're right-handed, you're hitting from your right shoulder. Well, if you put the ball above your head, you have to lean to get the contact above your head. So we have, here, here's like Tiger Woods. Tiger Woods doesn't, yeah, you got it, Kirk. Tiger Woods doesn't hit the golf ball. He swings the club and it just so happens there's a ball in the way. You have to think about your serve. If you demonstrate your serve, you're not falling over to the left. You're, when you demonstrate your serve, your contact is over here. It's like at one o'clock. So you got to toss to one o'clock, but you're tossing at 12 right above your head like mistletoe. So it pushes you back into the left. Toss forward into the court and at one o'clock. So 12 o'clock, one o'clock. Toss forward at one o'clock and you'll instantly stop uh, doing that. Uh, 45 degrees, I think it's a little far. I think it's a little far. Um, yeah, toward the net post. It has to do with um, the, and you can do that. If you're gonna toss it at 45 degrees to the net post, like especially on the do, the do side. Yeah, you got it, George, happy to help. Um, you better be hitting a side spin serve. If you're hitting, if you're tossing to the net post on the do side, I'm sorry, on the ad side, Kirk, as a uh, right-hander, um, then you can hit a little flatter because the, the court position is different, right? The, the way you position your body on the deuce side is going to be different on the ad side. And, and the lefties, you know, on the deuce side, they turn their body more. So then their toss is going to be different. You can't have the same toss every time. Uh, if I use a semi-western grip on my backhand with my right hand, um, are you, uh, Victor, are you left or right-handed? I would not use a semi-Western grip with your right hand if you were right-handed on a two-handed backhand. Uh, you're, 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 
you're going to struggle with high backhands. I can tell you that. You won't, like low backhands will probably be just fine because the racket's going to be slightly open. But the high ball, you've got to really roll it. So any tips on high balls with my two-handed backhand? I tend to slap at it when I caught uh, in between moving forward on the ball or backing up. Eric, uh, any tips on high balls with my two-handed backhand? I tend to slap at it when I get caught in between moving back and moving forward. Well, that's really the key. Here, here's one of the reasons players struggle with high balls, backhand, forehand, doesn't matter. One is they don't stand farther, far enough away from the ball. Right-handed, yeah, Victor, you gotta change your grip, buddy. You gotta go to a continental. Helps you close the racket face. You probably hit a very flat backhand. You're not getting topspin. And if you are getting topspin, then you are not using a semi-western. Maybe you're mistaken on the grip. But you're not like ripping the ball with topspin. Um, so here, here's some help on the higher ball. Somebody just asked about the, the high backhand. Your arm is a radius. So as your racket rises, it gets farther away from you. So the distance you stand away from the ball must change based on the height of the contact. So just realize your arm's a circle or draws a circle. So as, watch this, as I raise my racket, my racket gets farther away from me. So like here, my racket's down by my leg, but as I raise my arms, my racket gets farther away. One of the biggest reasons players struggle with higher balls is they stand too close to the ball. They stand as if they are the distance they should be when the ball is low. Really high balls, you stand under the ball, and really low balls, you kind of want to be where the ball is. The ball that you're going to stand the farthest from is a shoulder-level ball, head-level ball. That's this ball. So... One thing on the two hitter is you might be slapping at it or just not liking the shot because you're too close to the ball and you're getting jammed. So to easily or more easily handle higher balls, stand farther away. And then another thing is rotation of the body is super important. So use an open stance. So when you're dealing with an open stance, sorry, when you're dealing with a higher ball, open stance, which allows for body rotation, and then play farther away from the body, don't stand really close to the ball. Players always get jammed on high balls because they stand the same distance as if it's a low ball. Uh, what about semi-western on left hand for two and a backhand for, yeah, it's not so bad. Yeah, George, that's okay. That's what Djokovic does, his left hand's under. I don't like that, I like an Eastern, but it's no different than on the forehand. You can, you can be Eastern, you can be semi-Western. You're not gonna use a full Western on the back end. Uh, that's great advice. Never thought about the circle and the distance. My 10-year-old daughter tends to get too close all the time. Yeah, one thing, uh, one thing about getting too close to the ball is what you can do is ask your daughter to hit the frame of the racket on the outside. And when you, that forces them to stand farther away. So ask your daughter, hey, uh, just say, hey, hey, sweetie, I'm gonna feed you some balls. I, I call my daughter sweetie, so that's why I said that. Um, uh, you know, you tell your daughter, hey, I'm going to feed you some tennis balls. I, I want you to hit the frame right here and just see what she does. See, see what her, her response is. She might have to now stand farther away from the ball in order to make that happen. And what you might actually do is trick her into hitting a sweet spot while standing farther away. Fred, I'm curious, what is his, uh, what is this kind? It's not academic. Uh, the forehand of Kyrgios. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, it, that's not a forehand that people typically are taught. It's, it's like your signature. Think about in a junior program. You've got 15 kids taking a tennis lesson and the coach is telling them all the same thing and you look out and you see 15 different forehands because it's there, it's like handwriting. We, we, it's, well, it, it's not always a slap. No, he doesn't always a slap. Sliding on Slido K, uh, Clay just joined. Sorry, Ryan, guys and gals. Uh, what's up, Michael? You already covered this, but at my club, I asked the resident coach about sliding and how. I, I have no idea how to slide. I've never played on clay more than 10 times in my life. I, that's why I don't make any video. I mean, I live in Pennsylvania. There's no... <laughs> I have to, to find a red clay court, I would probably have to drive um, nine hours in any direction to try to find it. Where should you stand in doubles when your partner is serving? Uh, really simple. Right in the middle of the box. 
This person's on the line, but slightly shaded over to the center. And the returner is all based on the serve. So really fast serves or the ability to hit wide, whatever, they always change. But middle of the box, just like draw an X right in the middle. Server could be anywhere from here to here. I mean, if you really want to mess up the returner, stand out wide by the doubles line and the angle of the ball going, like they'll screw that up all the time. Um, especially if you kind of do it every now and then, they won't be able to figure it out. Um, so yeah, that's where you stand. But I work with coaches and communicate with them as an in, uh, intermediate. Uh, my eight-year-old struggles with his top spin. How can I find? Uh, let's see here. Sliding. Any tips for practicing with a ball machine? Um, yeah. First off, film yourself. When you're every time you go out on a ball machine, you need to film yourself and look at yourself, because people don't know what. Uh, what's up, Nikki? Cool. Um. Yeah, pe people go out and practice on a ball machine and they don't film themselves. So they have no idea what they're actually doing. You cannot go by feel. You have to film yourself. I've studied the word law directionals, but I have a question. If you run around your forehand, is that still considered an inside shot or is it considered an outside shot? Um, <laughs> that's a good question. Um, he here's the idea. An outside shot is, is here, an inside shot is here. Here's what you have to say. And, um, oh, sorry, 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 sorry. When the ball goes, let's say this is you, and the ball goes cross court like this, and you have this line through you, and it's like that. If the ball crosses through that line, to get to you, then you take it back cross court. If it doesn't cross through that line, then you can, if you'd like, go down the line. So um, I would say that's an inside shot. And now you can actually just hit that ball down the line. They have red clay in Allentown. There you go. Are you a fan of swing vision? Yeah. I just gave a lesson to a girl in Maryland yesterday. No. What day is today? Friday? Yeah, it was yesterday. Um, it was just a half an hour Zoom lesson. And I just studied her swing vision videos that she sent me. And uh, it was awesome. And we did a, a half an hour double, a single strategy class using her, her match play. It was a UTR event that she played and her mom just recorded it, sent me the link. I studied it for 20 minutes, came up with all the stuff I wanted to teach her, and we did a half an hour Zoom session on her match strategy, court position, shot selection. It was awesome. Mm. Tons of videos on dominant eye, yeah, and according to your stance of your shots, you typically don't talk about that. Is there a reason? Yeah, because somebody who's dying from a heart attack, you don't want to pay attention to their hangnail. Meaning eye dominance is so low on the list of stuff that is causing people to be searching videos on YouTube. Like if, like I, it's, if, let, let's talk about this. If eye dominance, if eye dominance was really the reason why Federer's head stays down because he's right-handed and left eye dominant, then why does his back, on his backhand does he keep his head down? Wouldn't he have to keep his head up on a backhand in order for his left eye to see the ball? I just think it's absolute crap. Uh, what is your best advice? And I, it doesn't mean there's not something to it. I mean, fixing a, a hangnail, it's important. But not if someone is dying of a heart attack, meaning they have the wrong grip, their swing is way too big, the racket's late, they don't split. Right? hey -oh, happy Friday. What's up, eh? So like, that's my point. It's like, it's just video after video after video of him going. And even the way, I'm sorry, but even the way he explains it, even the way he explains it, and like, it takes him seven minutes just to get the person to be, look. it's, it's really simple. Go like this and look through it. Now, which eye are you looking through? Like, it's so simple. It, it can be done like that. But 
I digress. Uh, what is your best advice for parents with aspiring junior players? Yeah, be really patient. Uh, after a match, don't let them be a backseat uh, be in backseat jail where you're driving home with them after a match where you didn't like the way they played and they're stuck in the back seat while you're berating them. Um, that's a big one. Oh, I told you, you should have, you did you know, whatever. It, it's, it's not easy to play tennis. Tennis is really hard. And it's one thing to be on the sideline and say, oh, I would have done this. I would have done that. I, it's one of the things I always ask people, you know, if they're parents, do you play tennis? And when they say no, I'm like, oh, because they have no idea how difficult it is. None. You can't pass the ball. This isn't basketball where you can just pass the ball to the best player and they can shoot for you. It's, it's really, really tough. Um, and do you, you have to teach your child, look, do you want to win little trophies or do you want to win big trophies? Because there are a lot of kids who just love the little trophies and they're playing little kid tennis and they stand behind the baseline and they just moon ball. And they lob and they lob and they lob and they win a ton of tournaments uh, in the eight and the under, eight and under, 10 and under, 12 and under, 14 and under. And then when they get to the 18s in college, they have no ability to go to the net, serve and volley. They have no transition skills and no ability to approach, um, no half volley skills. Um, yeah, you're right, Nikki. We all have, we all have. And so like we had a... Um, uh, the best junior at our club, he went on a full ride to Richmond uh, University. He was a top 20 player in the country. So he was, um, he w finished the year number 20 in the 18s uh, in USTA in the nation. And he served and volleyed since he was eight years old. And he got thrashed as an eight-year-old serving and volleying. 10-year-old serving and volleying. 12-year-old, he was serving and volleying. Couldn't win a tournament. But what was he doing? He was worried about the big trophies. He wanted to play division one college tennis. And he ends up number 20 in the country. Best doubles tips for high school tennis. Hit the ball to the opponent. Yeah, they win the little trophies. Yeah, you gotta have your sights on, what do you wanna be? Do you wanna, you wanna, you wanna finish college and work, uh, not finish college, finish high school and work at the grocery store down the street? You'll instantly start making money, or do you want to go to med school and be a, uh, you know, be a, you know, cardiothoracic surgeon? <laughs> One's thinking about the long game. Um, yeah, doubles tips. Yeah, super simple. I just mentioned them a couple of minutes ago, but you probably weren't here. The idea is really simple. Here are, I'll, I'll give you three tips that are really going to help you. And then we're going to end with this. When you are playing doubles, first, hit the ball to the opponent who is standing where you are standing. So if this is you and you're rallying, like you serve and then you're hitting back and forth, if you've got a forehand here, hit to the other baseliner and the other baseliner should hit to you. And the net players are trying to intercept the ball. And let's say this ball goes too close to this player, which is good for that player, you have to hit to this player. So baseliners hit to baseliners, net players hit to net players. Doubles, yeah, you got it. Happy to help, Kevin. Doubles is not a game of keep away. It's, it, it's not a game of look for open space. If you're looking for open space in doubles, you are gonna, you're just gonna be hemorrhaging points because the open space is so small because they've doubled the number of people compared to singles, but they haven't doubled the size of the court. So to miss, to not allow your opponent to touch the ball, if you're used to singles and hitting winners, it ain't gonna work out for you. So you have to hit the ball to the opponent who's standing where you're standing. The number one double strategy mistake that if you just eliminate this double strategy mistake, you will absolutely win more matches. When you're at the net, and if you can both be at the net, that's best, because then it's two against one, because this person doesn't, there, there's no lid for their pot. They're thinking, wait, who do I hit toward? I have to hit to the net player. I can't follow Ryan's rule. So they end up hitting the ball to a net player, and then you both pick on this person who doesn't have enough time to react. But the number one double strategy mistake is hitting overheads or high balls at the net and hitting it to the baseliner because they have more time to react. It's like playing dodgeball and aiming for the person, throwing the ball at the person farthest from you. 
and they have all that time to react. You gotta aim for the person. You're not trying to hurt them. You can just aim for their feet, aim for this side of the court, but you hit that ball. I'll give you two more. When you lob, so let's say um, you lob over that person and this team switches. Uh, do you know where these two players should go? You lob over your opponents, they switch. Where should these two players go? And I want you in your answer, so type it in right now. In your answer, I want you to tell me what shot this person is most likely going to hit back. Uh, we got service line, service line. Should, they should both come to net. Like how close? Net, both go to the service line because they will lob. So we have some conflicting answers. We have some people saying service line. And specifically, and specifically, Nikki, cool. Already said it. Uh, staggered. I, I like the idea. But I'm not a huge fan of staggered. And the only reason is staggered is one of those things. Uh, staggered means this, that the person... Um, in front of the ball is slightly in front. The problem is to get a team to stagger, like to get to, because so many times when we play doubles, we play doubles with people we've never played against or played with, or we rarely play with them. And to get them all on the same page, um, it's difficult. You want to put your toes on the service line. So toes on the service line. The reason is this person's going to lob the ball back. And if you get tight to the net or move up to the net, it makes it easier for them to lob over you. So since we know that they're gonna lob, why not put your toes on the service line? If they hit a bad lob, you can move in and aim for that player. If they hit a mediocre lob, it comes right to you. If they hit a great lob, you take two steps back. Like, if your toes are on the service line, not even Alcaraz can lob over you. Because the moment they hit it and they see it's high, you take two or three steps back and you put your racket up. No ball can go over you and then land in. So the ball never goes over your head. But what everyone does is they get super tight to the net and then the ball goes over their head and it's like, hey, they were, they were gonna lob. And then the last thing is when you are lobbed, what should you do? Because this gets messed up all the time. And I'm gonna make this my last thing and then I'm gonna ask that you don't leave because I just wanna tell you something for one minute. I've given you 62 minutes. All I ask is one minute of your time so I can tell you about something that's really cool. So this is you and the ball goes over your head and you're trying to hit an overhead, but you can't. And you say, yours, your partner comes and get it, comes to get it. Where should you go? Where should you go? And I want you to put it together with the information that we just talked about. <clears throat> it's an adverb, Nikki, L-Y, but you already know that. Uh, right side cover across diagonally so you can have more time to react. Perfect. I'm just busting on you. I'm just busting on you there, Nikki. Yes, you should move back diagonally and just go to the baseline. Just go to the baseline. Just go back. Uh, you know, somebody said go to the service line. But realize when you go to the service line, especially if this team goes to the service line themselves, toes on the service line, your partner hits an overhead, you're going to get blasted. If you go back at an angle, back to the baseline, then when your partner hits, let's say they hit short, then you can both come in and then you can attack the net. Or if you're both back and this person hits an overhead, you have time. If you move back, you can handle everything. If you stay up, you can only handle if your opponents hit a bad shot. You got it. All right, guys, really quickly. We got 42 people on here. I want you to stay for one minute. So on my website, 2minutetennis.net, I offer weekly classes. They're every Wednesday night, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 6 p.m. obviously on the West Coast uh, for the U.S. And they are live classes that are absolutely awesome. I go over different topics on the serve and the grips and double strategy, single strategy. This last Wednesday, thank you, Nikki. This last Wednesday, I just... Uh, had a free class that you can go on my website right now, now and check it out. Um, it was five ways to gain massive control, massive control over your forehand. 
The classes are always recorded, so if you cannot make the class live, you uh, can go on to the website. Premium membership, there are two choices for the premium membership. And you get a ton of stuff with the premium membership, not just these weekly classes. It's $40 per month. Cancel any time. Thank you, Tom. Or $3.99 for the year. And if you're a, a, a monthly member, you can switch over to a yearly membership and instantly get a credit for two free Zoom private lessons. When you become a member of the 40 a month membership, it is, there's one free Zoom private lesson credited to you, and then you get half price Zoom lessons going forward whenever you purchase them with me, so I can personally improve your game. If you get the yearly membership, you get two Zoom lessons credited to your account, and then half price lessons. Um, my courses, Master Your Serve, Master Your Forehand, Master Your Double Strategy, are all there, normally $97 each. They are included in the premium membership. You can go right now to twominutetennis.net, put in your info to check out all the stuff um, the premium membership is absolutely awesome. And, um, you can go right now, put in your stuff. When you go into the back area of my website, after you put in your email and your name, there's an area that says zoom class recordings. It's a blue thumbnail. Uh, oh, I'm going Alcaraz, going Alcaraz in four sets. Um, and there's a blue thumbnail that says zoom. You click there, scroll all the way down to the bottom because that's where the newest, uh, classes. And, um, uh, that's where the class was for th that I just ran or, and, uh, had this past Wednesday. So do I ever do on court sessions? Not really. I do about two a week. I do two, uh, two in-person lessons, um, for, uh, uh, on court. And I have had people fly in and I teach them for the day. That's super fun. Um, but I've, I, I left the court for a reason uh, because I'm very much like a family kind of work life balance kind of guy. Um, so I really don't do a lot of on court teaching anymore. So guys, if you would like me to help you, uh, he, he can't, uh, ever serve out important matches. Yeah. If you would like me to help you personally improve your serve, your forehand, your backhand, your neck game, your volleys, your footwork, your single strategy, your double strategy, go to two minute tennis.net, become a premium member, get a zoom lesson with me. And we can work putting your serve side by side with the pros. I'll meet live on Zoom with you and help you improve your game. I really appreciate it. Hello from Europe. I really appreciate it. I've been on here for 67 minutes. Don't worry if you just got on here. I am going to upload this on to YouTube. So uh, probably like an hour or so you'll be able to watch the whole thing from the front. So I'm serious. Thank you all from the bottom of my heart for all of your help, for all of your support. I really, really um, appreciate it. And uh, Pedro, cheers from Brazil. Thank you so, so much. I'll talk to you guys all, all later. Bye-bye.